Today in the life of the church, we begin a new journey and we begin a new series and we begin a, a new season together, the season of Lent. This is celebrated as 40 days that leads up to Easter and we'll unpack that just a little bit. Uh, but we're also beginning this new series about uh, this based on the, the book by Amy Jill Levine, Entering the Passion of Jesus. And so uh, I'm very excited that you're here to be a part of this. This Lent, our, our theme is really all around the idea of risk and we'll be exploring Holy Week. The, the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry that leads up to his crucifixion and then, of course, to his resurrection. So we're, we're really honing in on that last week. And, and we're seeing uh, all the different ways that Jesus demonstrates risk, that his followers encounter risk, uh, that the, the, the crowds around him and, and even th those who oppose him uh, are, are, are encountering risk and how it is that they choose to respond to those things. And we're going to unpack all of that and we're going to find out what that means for our lives and also connect it to the, the broader idea of Lent and what we usually celebrate in this season. And so again, like I said, I'm very excited for all of this. And I think there's going to be a lot for us to learn about what it means as followers of Jesus to, to healthily engage in risk and to trust that God meets us in the midst of all of that. I thought as we began this journey and entered into a new season, though, we, we ought to do a crash course on what exactly Lent is, because that may or may not be a term that you're familiar with, or at least in this context. Um, it's L-E-N-T, and, and what it means, because I think it's, it's helpful to remind ourselves of this, and if it's brand new, it's a good introduction for you. And so, as I've already said, Lent is a 40-day season. It does not count Sundays, and it begins Ash Wednesday, which was this last Wednesday, and it ends Holy Sunday. Saturday, which is the day before Sunday, between Good Friday and uh, Easter Sunday, excuse me. So that is Holy Saturday. That's sort of the season. And very often as a pastor, I get asked why, uh, why it's a, a, an odd number like that and why Sundays don't count. And Sundays don't count because we in the Christian faith uh, celebrate an empty cross and an empty tomb. And even in the season of penitence and reflection, uh, even in the season of preparation for the passion, we want to remind ourselves that uh, the death death is not the final story. And so we have these uh, sort of mini Easter or mini resurrection celebrations every Sunday. And that's why uh, Sundays don't count in the, that 40 days of Lent. Lent is from the word lecten, which means lengthening, as in the lengthening of the days. Maybe you've got to experience that with warmer weather and, and more daylight over these last couple of weeks because Easter always comes in the spring. Uh, it was sort of uh, connected with that idea. And I think that's a good and a beautiful reminder, but that's where that word comes from and why it's sort of an odd word for that setting. It, it's from a, a, a sort of a, a, a very old word that's not used any longer. Now, Lent is traditionally a time for repentance and for fasting, for self-examination and, and reflection. And so um, Lent is really rooted in this ancient season, before it was defined as it is, uh, of what early Christians would do leading up to the Easter season. So if somebody wanted to become a, a member of the, the body of Christ, to become a member of the church, they would enter into a long season of preparation and reflection, of repentance and penitence, of honesty, and, and of, of learning what this faith was all about. It, it sort of... Um, you might compare it to the confirmation process that we do for eighth grade students, except it was far more intensive uh, and f required far more honesty and a lot more repentance. And so people would enter into this, this phase uh, as they were uh, getting ready to become uh, disciples getting ready to become uh, members of, of the church. And, and that would always happen, uh, that would conclude with baptism and membership in the church. And that initiation always happened on Easter. And so uh, for as long as the Christian church has been around, there has been this history uh, of taking some serious reflection to lead up to Easter. Uh, this was also a time where people who had become separated from the community, uh, people who had uh, participated in particularly um, egregious sins, uh, who had been sort of uh, uh, cast out or, or chosen to cast themselves out of community. It was a time uh, where they were also invited into a penitent season of confession and forgiveness in order to be reinstated and readmitted to the community of faith. And so for, again, for as long as the Christian tradition has been around, the season leading up to Easter has been crucially important. And uh, I, I love that because I think it sort of shapes how we understand our time even now. 
basically we're invited to give up all that is not Jesus, uh, to, to turn away from what is not Jesus, to, to travel away from what is not Jesus, and instead uh, turn towards what is Jesus, what is God's kingdom, what is our place in the world, to turn away from that which is not God and towards that which is God, to repent, literally to turn uh, from the things within us and around us that we idolize or prioritize over our relationship with God, over our love of neighbor, and to reset our intentions and align ourselves with God's work in the world. A couple more pieces about this. Uh, so the, the early church did this as a preparation season. It wasn't necessarily 40 days. And then later in the Christian faith, uh, we began to, to, to use that 40-day number, uh, really hearkening back to Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. If you want to read about it, it's Matthew 4. Uh, Jesus, and it's in the other Gospels as well, but Jesus uh, intentionally withdraws from community, goes out into the wilderness right before he begins his ministry. And so uh, that period that he's out there is 40 days. And in many ways, Lent is a a willing, a willing choice to enter into the wilderness. Um, it, it's an intentional choice on our part to, to put ourselves in some kind of, of, of wilderness to remind ourselves of a radical dependence and need for God and, and to, to um, build our ability to, to connect with God in the midst of that. And so that paradigm is where the 40 comes from, but it's also a good paradigm entering the wilderness for what Lent is about. From all of this, we get the idea that, that Lent uh, is a time for fasting, uh, abstaining from certain things. It's a time for repentance. It's a, a time for us to look very honestly and very soberly at our own and the world's mortality, sinfulness, brokenness, all of those things. In some ways, I like to think about Lent as a, as a reckoning with the very most human, broken, limited parts of ourselves and of the world around us. So we willingly enter that wilderness. We risk the journey trusting that while there may be difficulty and there may be challenge and, and, and there may be parts of us that we have to give up, things that even die. This story of Lent leads us to the passion narrative. What we also trust is that there is life beyond the challenge. There is life beyond death that we ourselves at this particular time and place cannot even fathom or imagine. And so we enter into this willingly and trusting that God will meet us and guide us there. This is the season of Lent, friends, and I'm so grateful that you're here for it. As we make our way through the six and a half weeks, uh, we'll be looking at the events of Holy Week. And Holy Week begins with Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem that we celebrate each year on Palm Sunday. And by the way, I am so excited for us to be together in person this Palm Sunday to see children holding palms, to be able to walk around, to celebrate. I, I'm just incredibly excited about it this year. I've missed that these last two years, and I think it will be an incredible blessing for us to be together on that day. And by the way, that sort of captures the energy of what we read about and what we celebrate on this day. And so I wanna read the story from Matthew's gospel. This uh, Palm Sunday triumphal entry is in all four of the gospels. We're gonna read from Matthew's. This is chapter 21, verses one through 10, if you wanna follow along. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, tell your daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and they put their cloaks on them and Jesus sat on the cloaks. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. This is a very loaded moment. There's a lot of energy and tension and excitement that's happening right here 
It's also a, a tense moment, as we'll sort of unpack as we go. It's layered with meaning and with intentionality. And, and Jesus has orchestrated this moment in order to, to fulfill something that, that we read about in the Old Testament, as Matthew has made reference to, um, to, to sort of um, give this a profound meaning to say there's something significant going on right here. It is the fulfillment of what has been promised, most especially from Isaiah and Zechariah. In the book that we're using for this series, Amy Jill Levine talks about these Old Testament references. And so right at the beginning, Jesus sends the disciples to get the donkey and to get the colt. And he, he's, he quotes, uh, Matthew quotes Zechariah 9. I want to read just this, this bit for us because I think it's, it's helpful to get the whole context. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And I want to say a couple of things about that. First of all, that, that triumphant, um, that doesn't mean sort of victorious or power over. What it really means is righteous, that this one is righteous. Uh, the victorious doesn't, again, mean power over. What it's really talking about is uh, we have been saved. Victorious, delivered uh, is more the connotation. And finally, humble. When we read that, sometimes we think about a meekness, but instead what it really means is somebody, a leader who has power that does not lord it over other people. And so that's the vision that we're getting as, as Matthew is saying all of this and, and Jesus is orchestrating this and the people are shouting around him. The, the reference to Isaiah 62 is small, but, but I would encourage you this week to take some time to read all of Isaiah 62. It's, it's pretty short and it's this beautiful passage. In essence, if you take the whole chapter of Isaiah 62, what it's talking about is uh, community uh, together rejoicing because of redemption. And Isaiah is writing in a time when that felt very unlikely and improbable. So it's this beautiful imagery, I think, when we put it all together. Matthew is telling us of a victory parade, in short. And the way that Jesus has orchestrated it and the words that the people say, all of it is speaking of victory and of joy and of triumph and of what God is able to do. It all happens in a context where it seems improbable. And maybe we can relate to that. So we see that all throughout, even as the crowd shouts, Hosanna. Hosanna, save us. There's one other piece of context that we need to have in order to understand the significance and why this moment is so palpable and so important. Just on the other side of town from the other gates, there is also a parade happening as Pilate comes into Jerusalem. Well, people are getting ready for Passover and so uh, Jews from all over and Pilate as a representative of the Roman Empire are all pouring in to Jerusalem. Pilate is coming not with peasants cutting off branches on trees and laying them down, not with cloaks laid at the feet, but instead with a horse and a chariot. There are soldiers and servants, there's pomp and circumstance and fanfare and prestige. And so this juxtaposition of Jesus's victory parade and Pilate's is incredibly important and it helps us understand the tension that is building in this story. It's out of that tension that we can understand the risk. For Jesus, entering Jerusalem is a risk. He'll encounter danger there. I mean, we know this because we know the end of the story. We have hindsight. We know where this ends. We know that the crowd is fickle, that they're celebrating and they're grateful and they're joy-filled in this moment. But before long, they'll be yelling, crucify him. We know the shift is that, that is going to happen. And so we understand the risk of this moment. But here's the deal. You don't need hindsight. You don't need to know the full story to know what's going on. If you do what we talked about last week, if you read through one of the gospels, what you'll find is that the, the tension is building through the whole story. And this is almost a, a climactic moment or the beginning of a climactic moment. You can feel all of that happening if you read through it. You can feel that tension that's illustrated in the two parades happening. You can feel it building chapter upon chapter upon chapter. And, and uh, we, we know that there, there's a, a level of risk and danger to this because the disciples have named it. Jesus has named it. There's probably one of my favorite examples comes from uh, John chapter 11. If you want to read about it, Jesus says in chapter 7, he said, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the leaders there were just trying to stone you and you're going to go there again? Jesus says, yes, you're right. They, they were trying to stone me. 
And yes, we are going to go back. They recognize the danger of this moment. And it's really a, 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 an internal reckoning moment for the disciples. Do you say this man is walking into his own death? I'm not going to be a part of this. Or do you do what Thomas, the one that we will give the name doubting to, does? He says in, in verse 16 to all of his fellow disciples, let us then go to that we may die with him. So if he's going to die, we're going to go with him. There is this sense of danger and risk that everybody who's in this story is well aware of. That's part of what we're talking about this season. Now, Jesus is also um, not the only person who's risking. It's easy to look at him as the main character of the story. But as we go through this series, I'm very often going to draw our attention to the nameless or the faceless people that are a part of the story. So the crowds on this day, uh, we'll see the woman who comes to anoint Jesus' feet. Very often in the biblical story, uh, we can best find ourselves related to what's going on with the people who don't have a name, whose occupations aren't recorded, whose significance isn't immediately clear. Very often, they're a, a key point of the story and a place that we can see ourselves. So I'm going to encourage us to look at that. Those whose identities we, we don't know very much about and those who can be so fickle, like we can be fickle from time to time. And so for the crowd, they also are facing risk. And this risk is really multifaceted. And this is what I want to talk about as we wrap up this morning. They're, they're risking by waving palms on that particular day. Uh, they're, they're risking by participating in a victory parade while Pilate enters from the other side of town to hail this one. This king is a risk. He's not the one who's got the empire's army behind him. To lift your voice instead of for the powerful, but for the one who will willingly lay power down. To raise your hallelujah for a radically different way of being in the world, not focused on individual prestige or promotion. To orient your life differently and to work for God's kingdom is to challenge the powers that be, or as Amanda Gorman would say, to challenge what just is. That was true in first century Palestine, and it's true in the year 2022 as well. It was a risk to pledge victory, to declare victory or pledge faith or allegiance in something, in someone who doesn't have the weight of all of the power, of all of the finances, of the military and the money, behind them to declare that Jesus is Lord and to emulate his self-emptying kind of power and love, friends, that is a risk. When they're waving those palms, it's very possible that the, the Roman Empire and the army marching in from the other side of town just comes and crushes them, and yet they show up anyway. Part of the risk is just showing up and declaring allegiance to something different than the status quo. The, the crowd is also facing risk because of what they say, Hosanna, save us. As we talked about in our prayer this morning, to, to, to ask to be saved is important, but it in and of itself is also a risk. To acknowledge that we need to be saved requires us to, to be a little bit more vulnerable and honest than sometimes we would like to be to recognize that we need change and, and to know that change is always hard, even if it's good change, that is a risk for us, friends. It is a risk to declare that somebody is more powerful than us. Somebody has the right to, to call us to account and somebody has the ability to meet us with forgiveness, that we're in need of grace that we receive from somebody else. All of that is a risk. And to pray for something that we need healing for that in and of itself is a risk. Have you ever felt anxious about asking for something because you weren't sure if you were going to get it? To even be vulnerable and open enough to declare, God save us, God save me, requires risk. Because the fact is, friends, that sometimes we won't see the answer to that at least in a way that we understand on this side of eternity. It's not guaranteed that we'll have our requests fulfilled. So to put them out there knowing that, that's risky business. This Lent, are we willing to confess that we need saving? Are we willing to reckon with what we talked about Ash Wednesday, that, that, that we are very frail and human, 
that we have come from dust and to dust we shall return? Are we willing to, 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 to repent and to believe the good news of God's grace and mercy? Are we willing to declare that we need help, that we need healing, that we need change and transformation, that the world is not as it should be? Are we willing to declare that? Can we do it in faith and risk not getting an answer that we understand and risk going through the, the difficulty of, of change and transformation so that we can find healing and wholeness? Are we willing to risk that this Lent? Are, are you? Let's take this one, one level more broad. When we look at what happens um, when we cry for fixing and for saving, we also have to talk about that beyond ourselves in the systems and the structures of the world that is around us. When we ask, as we did in our prayer for uh, the, the fixing and healing of broken systems, which rob people of life and goodness rather than promote shalom and peace as God has imagined for the world. When we do all of that, we're pushing up against systems that have power. When we declare that systems promote injustice and oppression, when we're crying for truth to prevail and to be taught, sometimes that's not going to be received well. Sometimes when we're crying out for an alternative kingdom, not that of the empire, represented by Pilate's entrance on the other side of town, Sometimes when we're crying out for the meek king, for the restoration that we talked about last week, Revelation 22, all things set right, sometimes we're going to offend the powers that be. That's a risk, and that can put us in a dangerous situation. However, waving the palms, showing up to the parade, showing up to vote, those are risks, but I, but I think the real risk will come. And this is where my challenge is for you this week. I think the real risk will come, not when we join the crowd, but when we decide if we're willing to work for what we yell for. Will we work for what we yell for? Amy Jill Levine says that this crowd wants what everybody wants. They want a balanced budget. They want equity. They want affordable health care and food and safety. From the beginning of time till now, people have wanted the same things. They cry out for them for deliverance from God. We cry out for them. We vote for them. We say that we want them. The question is, are we willing to risk participation? Not just showing up and lifting our voice, but actually living day to day, week to week, year to year, living and, and walking the walk instead of just talking the talk. I get to lead a, a small group on this series with Stacy. And by the way, you can still be a part of it Thursday evenings. But something she said was incredibly helpful to me. Our place in bringing about God's kingdom, doing that work, we get to examine our expectations and risk and sacrifice in a world that quite frankly isn't fair. Are we willing to do that? Not just to, to shout that, that God needs to save us, not just to encourage Jesus but to participate in the work of bringing that kingdom about here and now. Again, from Stacy, are, are we just standing on the sidelines waving branches? Are we willing to get into the world and bring about the justice that God is truly calling for? Are we willing to risk for the injustice in the world? Or are we bystanders sitting on the sidelines? So as we enter into this Lenten season, my question is whether we're, we're actually willing to risk it, not just say it, but to be engaged and involve it. Yes, raise your voice. That's important. Join the parade, but also walk the walk and live the life. To share unpopular opinions and uncomfortable truths, to declare nonetheless that this humble king is the one who can bring about salvation, that his way, that does not shy away from, from conflict, his way of a peaceable kingdom is the true way that leads to life. Are we willing to cry out for what is God and push back against what is not God? Are we willing to walk and participate day after day and year after year? As I was thinking this week about the risk of participation, of course, I, I kept thinking about what's going on in Ukraine and the invasion that, that has happened and the war going on there. And actually, it was interesting because I, I thought for once in, uh, uh, in, in, in a blue moon, it, it comes about that raising your voice 
and walking the walk are, are actually one and the same, that, that the risk of lifting an unpopular opinion comes with it very real consequences. So this week I was thinking about the bravery and the courage, uh, not only of the people of Ukraine, but of the people standing in the capital of Russia, protesting an unjust war. You know, I know that's not going to end well for them. And we've seen the arrests. Dissent isn't accepted in that place. And I just have to look at myself and wonder, would I have the courage to cry out for a different way of being in the world if I was in their position? Would I be willing to show up if I knew the cost? That's the challenge for us, friends. If we can take stock of the cost and the stark reality of the difficult world that we live in and still choose to show up, still choose to say it, still choose to walk the walk day after day, year after year. Lent isn't a season where everything gets fixed, but it is a season where we're invited to practice the risk of working for God's kingdom, of moving closer to God, of letting go of those things that keep us from living in God's vision for ourselves. This is the invitation. Welcome to the Passion. As we prepare to wrap up service, I wanna thank you for worshiping with us and invite you to continue to join us in weeks to come. We'll have a few moments of reflection this day in one closing song and then I hope you'll go to, to walk the walk, to live the life, to practice in this season of Lent what it means to work for and live for and trust for God's kingdom even here and now. Go in grace and go in peace. Amen. Amen.